The fifth speaker of the day is Engineer Ahmad Isdihar, who graduated from University of New York in Bachelor Mechanical Engineering Polytechnic in 1993. He is a registered professional mechanical engineer with more than 25 years experience as a consultant in the building industry. He is the managing director of Energy CX Sindrian Berhad, an environmentally sustainable design consultancy based in KL. He also is a registered Green Building Index facilitator. IR Ahmad is a past president of Malaysian Green Building Council, also known as Malaysia GBC, for year 2016 to 2018. He often lectures on various energy and sustainability topics for MGBC. He also has certified and trained the trainer certificate by HRD Corp. The topic of his speech is Towards Net Zero, MGBC Carbon Score. Towards Net Zero, MGBC Carbon Score. Please join me in welcoming IR Ahmad Isdiha. Uh, a very, very, very good afternoon to all. Uh, still not full yet. I hope that I can keep you guys from actually falling asleep because it's just after lunch, right? Okay. Towards net zero. Right. Well, what is that, actually? Okay. We, I'm from Malaysia Green Building Council. We are part of a big family of the world's Green Building Councils, okay, and it's called the parent group is called World Green Building Council, obviously, right? So uh, there's a program going on, right? And we all know the challenges we have in terms of climate change now, right? Global warming, okay, due to you know greenhouse gases that's released into the atmosphere. And those comes from, believe it or not, a cow's burp, right? And those which are in the ground and we are keep digging it up. The ones that we put in our automobiles, the ones that you use to generate electricity and whatnot. So it's in ground, we are digging it up, we are releasing it back into the atmosphere. That causes global warming. And when global warming happens, the temperature goes up and if it reaches 1.5 degrees, Celsius compared to pre-industrial times, we are in trouble. If it goes more than that, start buying life vests and you know, keep a boat in your house because we are all going to be underwater soon. Okay, once the polar ice cap melts, and else, yeah. right? So, what is it about? Okay, let me introduce you. Introduce to you, MGBC's a carbon score program. Okay, it's called Carbon Score Program. It's very obvious, right? Okay, it's Carbon Score Program. Then we will go through, uh, I will introduce you what is it. And we will go through the, uh, how do we arrive at those numbers. And some sampling means that we have done our homework. Okay, and we have actually chosen a few pilot projects which were actually just recently, uh, last weekend during IGM, we actually announced it, right? Our pilot projects. Okay, this is the key figure here is the 1.5 degrees Celsius, okay? The world itself, UNFNCC, okay? This is the parent uh, holder of the uh, Kyoto Protocols and the Paris Agreement saying that, okay, okay, look, we got to work towards this. We got to keep it 1.5 degrees and below within in this century, okay? And this century, yeah, it's going to end soon, right? Okay, so the last COP, uh, climate change conference in uh, the UK, right, in Scotland, right, uh, Malaysia went up and said that, okay, okay, we promised the world, we promised the world that we are going to actually reduce its economy wide carbon intensity against our GDP, of course, by 45% in the year 2030. And the whole world, the target for the whole world is actually carbon neutrality by 2050. Okay, 
What happens in 2050? We now have 7 billion people on Earth. In 2050, we probably have 10 billion people. Okay, more buildings are going to be built. You know, and if the temperature goes up, we won't have enough uh, produce. Okay, we are going to have food scarcity issues. Okay, we, we're going to have to feed 3 billion more people on Earth. Okay, and we have to build more buildings, right, to house these people, whether it's residential, whether it's offices, whether, you know, habitat, right? We're creating habitat for people. Okay, and our carbon score, that means MGBC's carbon score, is aligning ourselves with this target, with Malaysia's target. Okay. Why, why, why is it? Why green buildings? Why are not we looking, just looking at transportation? Why are not we just looking at, you know, other things? Why must it be buildings? Okay. So, statistically, all right, 40% of the global CO2 emissions come from buildings. Right? And we clump the buildings together, we do up a township, and we add in transportation, we add in everything else, and still cities. Okay. We are going to increase that contribution to 70%. That's a lot. Okay. And you imagine now you have extra 3 billion people on earth. We're going to expand our cities. We're going to expand sideways. We're going to expand up. We're going to put roofs all over uh, these people's head. Right? Okay. So, building stocks. Okay. We have 85% of new buildings with only 15% of new buildings, sorry, 85% of older buildings, which has already been completed, is in operation compared to only 15% of the buildings currently, which is currently being built. Okay. So we have to actually look at the existing buildings. All right. And as of this year, the whole building stock in Malaysia is only 0.1% has been actually green certified. 0.1%. There's a lot more out there that, you know, that does not have a green certification, you know, that does not know where they stand in terms of their carbon emissions. Okay, again. The, gold, uh, the world building stock will increase by double by 2050-2060, right? Okay, so that's why this carbon score is uh, for buildings, right? It's a benchmark for buildings, it's a health scorecard for buildings. All right, what is the mission statement, our mission statement with this carbon score? Now, when we got to tell everyone who owns a building, who operates a building, right, that this is your number, right? And this number, you can have this number from your existing data which are already available to you. This is not something that you need to go back and call a consultant and, you know, simulate the whole building and see top, down, up, you know. You do not have to do fancy calculations. It's only with the data that you already have at hand which is your bills, which is the type of building that you have, right? So it's easy enough, right? So we have to make the invisible visible so that people would know, okay? If we go to a health checkup, you know, and then doctor says that, oh, actually you have diabetes, then only, I do, yeah. right? If you don't go, you won't know, right? So this is the same concept, okay? And Carbon score is for all Malaysian buildings, all. Existing museums, hospitals, offices, hotels, everything, all. Okay, so what is it? It's a scale, 0 to 100. Why 0 to 100, not 0 to 50, not 0 to 150? Because we are all Malaysians here, we know 100. That means that you have everything right. You have got, got everything correct. Zero means that you didn't get anything. Right? So it's easy for us. Here we know zero to hundred, right? So, and the building will never go below zero. The carbon score will never go below zero. Which zero represents your business as usual building. But it can go more than a hundred. 
means that you're doing something really right. You're getting all those uh, plus credits, you know, extra credits, and you're actually helping, actually reducing others' carbon footprint. Okay? So it means that your score can be more than 100, but never go negative. Okay. How is it calculated? You know, what goes into the carbon score? These are the few items that goes into the carbon score. Okay. Now, one is your operational carbon footprint. Right? Number two is the embedded carbon when you actually build the building. Okay. Then the emissions from associated transport, uh, sorry, associated emissions from the transportation that you take to go to the building and from the building to go back to your transportation hub. Right? And if you're putting renewable energy, if you, you, you're, you're utilizing uh, photovoltaics to get renewable energies, that counts as a on-site uh, energy generation. Last one is purchase carbon offsets, which in Malaysia, we are not there yet. Okay, the mechanism is coming soon, right? In a few years, I would, I would, I would suspect, right? So these are the things. Okay, now you might be asking, uh, yeah, how do you put numbers to that, right? Okay, if we go into that, means that we're going to end tomorrow. So, <laughs> okay, the details will be revealed soon. And, uh, okay, it's safe to say that, look, it uses algorithms that takes inputs from the building's topography, the type of building, the size of the building, okay, uh, the system that is employed in the building, right, and the method of construction that you have actually chosen to build the building, right, and how far your building is from the transportation hub. So those are the factors that goes into a black box, okay, <laughs> and it comes out with a score, right. And that uh, we will actually uh, go on a roadshow for that soon. Okay, to explain how are all of these factors calculated. Okay, the program itself. The program itself consists of uh, tier one and tier two, in which tier one is actually the simplest form of carbon score, is for public certification. Anybody can do it, building owners, uh, facilities managers, right? Uh, a person who's assigned to take care of the building's bills, okay? Anyone with the data and has access to the data can actually calculate the carbon score. It's as easy as that. This is for public, all right? Even a guy from not within your uh, building, uh, not within building, can come in and actually just get your data and calculate. So what it means is that you do not need fancy uh, calculations to do it. You do not need a consultant to do it. You can do it, right? And we go up to tier two. It's part of the program. Tier two is actually, we call it Carbon Score Plus. These are for the bigger organizations, okay? Uh, which needs uh, verified carbon accounting for their ESG commitment. Means that big banks, uh, be organizations, eh? right? Financial institutions, and these are actually later. I will show you. Uh, it actually is verified by professionals. Okay, so if you walk into a restaurant, right, and you see a label, normally it's at the cashier, right? See, it's A means that uh, okay, it's actually clean, right? If you go for C, uh, you wouldn't want to eat there, isn't it? So that's for restaurants. Or you want to buy a 57-inch uh, LED TV, you go and look at one star, you know. You're probably going to switch it on all the time anyway, so you're going to spend your money paying for electricity if you get that. So the same concept. So you want to walk into a building and say, that, wow, it's 50. So this guy is halfway to carbon zero at a glance. That's the whole point of having a carbon zero, at a glance. So you go in, you look at it, you know, hey, this, on, this guy is on the right track, right? Minor improvements, they can get there, okay? And what is the target here? The target is for public certification by public adoption. You want everybody to adopt this labeling, 
carbon score labeling. Everyone, you can go walk into a building, you can see it. Okay, that's the target. Right? And you will know where you are in the bigger scheme of things. You look at your score and you say, one, you say, I'm like 99% off to carbon zero. I need to do something about it, right? But you can do your accounting yourself, all right? So it is for building owners and facilities manager, okay? And we are also, uh, we are actually targeting a lot more existing buildings because uh, newer buildings are easier because you haven't done anything yet. You get the, all the chance for you to actually do the right things, okay? And you can do it for any type of building. Take a museum, you take a hospital, you take anything. You can actually get a carbon score. And you can integrate this with any of the current existing uh, green building certification. Right? You can have your certificate for, from, uh, from green RE and you can have carbon score next to it. You can have from GBI next to it. You can have uh, anything, right? So it's in line. Okay, then we go a bit into the carbon score plus. Okay, it is. It will be complying to the established international CO two accounting standards. Means that the GHG protocols, the ISO fourteen sixty four. Uh, WRI, Vera Org, and CDP Global ETC. Okay, and it is going to be specifically designed to align with the more rigorous CO2 reporting requirements of listed companies, financial institutions, large scale developers, manufacturers, and multinationals. Okay, and and if you are on the BURSA board, you will have to do up your sustainability accounting, your ESG commitments. It, you need to disclose, right? So this is part of your disclosure, okay? Uh, SDG and ESG commitment, okay? Okay, this is how I look at ESG. ESG is basically telling people is your behavior, the organization's behavior, right? Your behavior towards environment, your behavior towards governance, your behavior towards the social, right? And Basically, it's just like I'm a good boy or I'm not a good boy, okay? And it all comes down to perception. But the numbers will tell you whether you're really hitting it and you're really achieving it or not, okay? And, uh, okay, and it's going to be accredited by Carbon Score Auditor, CSA. This is in the works, okay? So, it's, Carbon Score is for public, and Carbon Score Plus is for bigger players. Okay, so how does it look like? This is the label that's going to be uh, at your reception of any building. Okay, uh, on the on your on your uh, on your left is zero. That means that you are business as usual. Carbon Score hundred means you are at Carbon Score. Of uh, you know you have achieved carbon zero for your building, right? And why why is this important? Because you can actually look at it and you know at a glance even if the numbers are not there. So you look at the black line and you look at the black, white and green line. So if you have just a black line, you know that this guy is just like you know business as usual, and you have. Green means that you're offsetting it with renewables. The white band below the black line means that you are actually on an energy efficiency program and you have actually managed to reduce down your energy use. That means that you also have reduced your carbon footprint based on your energy use. Okay. And if you look at the QR code, because we are all we all have QR code since uh, my suggestion times, right? So you can actually scan it, and the details of the building will come out on your phone. So you can have all of the data that's associated with this carbon score. All right, let's go to the numbers. Okay, there are some mistakes in the numbers. Uh, uh, just let me know if you can actually spot it. Okay, towards the end. Okay, that's that's your quiz. <laughs> okay, the carbon score. 
Basically, the carbon score deals with energy. Energy, okay? The total carbon footprint down there deals with your carbon emission, okay? That means that the total carbon footprint adds in your uh, embodied CO2, adds in your commuting, adds in your waste. Your energy is directly converted into the score itself. Okay. Are we going to address this? Yes, these other things, a waste commuting. Okay. Okay. Soon, later, MGBC will also come up with water score and transportation score and whatnot. Okay. This is on energy. Okay. Try, try not to be confused by all of the numbers on top of the label itself. So, 41 means, if you look at it, EE reduction is 39% and on-site renewable energy production is 2%. If you add those together, you will get 41. Okay? So, it's as easy as that. I'm, I'm shooting over time, is it? It's just okay. Okay. Separate indicators will show your contribution. What's your savings? What's your contribution for renewable energy? Okay, so that's the white band and the black band. Okay, how do we have the benchmark done? The benchmark is done for the type of building complying to MS1525-2019. MS152019 is the code of practice for energy efficiency in buildings. Right? And it has a counterpart of 2680, which is for residential. Right? So it's based on that, that's where the benchmark is packed. Okay. So from the line itself, you can see how much uh, CO2 is offset by the green line. And the black line is actually uh, what is your carbon emission. Okay, then the QR code is where you get more information about the building. Okay, we have tested this carbon score. Okay, we do have access to uh, buildings that has been rated by Green Building Index. So if you take 57 buildings, put it on the table, do the carbon score for every single one then, and we can see the range, of course. Okay? And from all of these 57 green buildings, okay, is, is a combination of, of uh, uh, a certified green buildings, uh, silver rated, uh, gold buildings, and platinum buildings. So you have every single rating in that mix. And 50 of 50 of those buildings uses the uh, non-residential new construction and seven non-residential existing buildings. You might be saying, uh, you said that 85% of existing building, you know, buildings in Malaysia are existing. Those 50 were rated with new construction buildings, but it is now an existing building. Okay, so we are getting live data for all this. Okay, so it is done with the just carbon score. We did not even go to the carbon score plus. Okay, so the pilot project and case studies are being calculated. The carbon score was, uh, were, uh, was were being calculated with the basic certification only. All right. So you like this picture, right? Every single one of these. So what you can see is actually you look at the marks, uh, and you look at the black lines, and you can actually easily associate those marks, okay, those uh, marks with the carbon score, right? You can see, uh, oh, that's a huge black line over there. Oh, mine is 11, right? Look at the largest black line, it's actually one, okay? So from all of this, when we tabulated, okay, and this is a blow up of those, okay, and you tabulate that, uh, let me get to that page. We've done for every single one, right? So the highest is actually 102, which means that this building has actually 
achieve carbon zero. Okay, it has actually, it has even better by two. Okay. So how did it get there? You look at the green line, means that they have offset 22% of their energy use with renewable energy. 22%. Imagine how big of a you know, solar plant, if it's a solar plant, okay, that they have actually put on top of the roof to get 22% okay, of the energy produced by renewables. Sorry, produced from renewables. Okay. And that compared to the lowest score, which is one, and you can see the green band, no, they actually attempted, they actually did one, only 1% one of the, uh, the, the energy comes from renewable energy, but the rest is business as usual. They did not do any energy efficiency. This means like you, 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 you take an old building and suddenly, okay, let, let's do energy efficiency, and slap a PV on top of your roof, and you hope that that will bring your carbon score to 100. No, it wouldn't happen that way. Yeah? So you have to look at all aspects of it. All right, and 41, okay, this is the average, right? It's roughly there with combination of energy efficiency and renewable energy. Okay, so there, you can see that the carbon offset is only 2% of the total building energy consumption. Okay, then you have 33. Okay, average for certified rated GBI buildings is 33. Okay, from that 57 case study. And if you move up to silver, roughly it's about 47, the carbon score. Let's move up. Gold and platinum will roughly touch 57. Means that you're halfway there towards net zero carbon. So if you say that you have a platinum building, you probably are, uh, you're probably halfway there. Okay. 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 During iGEM, we actually presented five pilot projects. Okay. In the interest of time, I probably would not be able to go through all these five, but I've chosen two, the last two, the IOC Mall and the University of Technology Sarawak. Okay. Can anybody spot the mistake? Okay, there's a mistake here. <laughs> okay, I asked City Mall. This is not new. It has been there for quite some time, right? So we've all been there, right? Hopefully, right? A anybody who has not yet been to IOI City Mall? Right, everybody has been there, right? It's a big mall. <laughs> okay, it's close to Putrajaya, Malaysia. The project size is 211,472 meters square. That's huge. <laughs> okay, it's constructed uh, 2014 and completed. All right, these are all the parties who are involved in actually getting this building done. Okay, of course, you have the owner, IUI City Mosque neighborhood, right? And, and yeah, I think we all know this, this guy, sir. Okay, quite, quite. Also name here in Malaysia, right? Okay. It achieves a score of 45. For a, such a huge mall, it's close to halfway to carbon zero. Close to halfway. How did they actually do it? Okay, that, that will probably be the main question. That how, it's, it's a huge mall. You have a lot of things in the mall. Right? How did they get there. So, they have managed to actually reduce their energy efficiency, sorry, achieve energy, uh, better efficiency in using their energy by 38% compared to a business as usual building, which is in compliance to MS 155. For a mall, okay, they have reduced 38%. So, the sheer you know, capacity of what they have actually done. Okay, they have reduced 38% of their energy consumption. Right? What did they do? The biggest one that can be identified, of course, there are a lot of other things there, lighting, you know, their controls and everything. 
but one of the biggest things that they have actually used is thermal mass storage. Okay, thermal mass storage. So, okay, it reduces the peak demand and increases overall system efficiency. Okay. I would refrain myself from going into the details because there will be a lot of things to talk about. Okay. All right. And they actually put on their roofs 3,564 kilowatt peak of renewable energy. So you imagine if you put it at, nowadays you can get one kilo, kilowatt peak uh, about, I think, 5,000 ringgit, 5 to 8,000 ringgit. So just do the math. Huh? That amount with 5,000 ringgit per kilowatt per kilowatt peak, right? So, and that takes care of 7.3 percent of their uh, energy use. Okay. Okay. Then, UTS University Technology Sarawak. This is the first platinum rated building in Sarawak and the first platinum rated university, GBI, GBI platinum rated university, okay. So it's located in Cebu, okay, 30,639 meters square, about 13 uh, buildings altogether, right. So it's completed uh, in 2013. And these are the people who are involved in the uh, project, okay. And, okay, yes, achieve 59. Okay, it's close to, that's another 40% to uh, carbon zero. Okay. Uh, again, they have achieved it by actually using very, very good design. Okay, they have actually uh, have automation on their lighting, you know, efficiency in their air conditioning and actually uses a lot of daylight, right? Okay, uh, yeah, energy efficiency lighting, and they have actually put in 4% of renewable energy on top of their roofs to cover. Okay, uh, time's up, I guess. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, one last thing. Where is it? Did it go? Put back the last slide, please. I want to... Okay, when is this carbon score going to be available? Okay, the first quarter of 2023. Watch MGPC's website, always keep, you know, going to it. Okay, look at it. It will be launched together with the free online CO2 calculator for everybody to use. Okay. So starting January, 1st of January, uh, 2nd of January, okay, 1st of January, public holiday, okay, 2nd of January, you start going to the website and look at it, you know. It is going to be launched in the first quarter of 2023, okay. Uh, any questions on the carbon score, which requires final explanation, okay, you can email us at mcs at mgbc.org.my. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, IR Ahmad Isdiha. Before we move on to the next session, I would like to make a final call for the guests who have not registered themselves. Please do so at the pre-function area for the lucky draw later on. Coming up next, we have the sixth speaker of the day, Muhammad Razif Muhammad Yusuf. He joined Saim Dhabi Property Berhad in January 2021 as the head of safety and sustainability overseeing health, safety and environment, sustainability, quality, and security. Since then, he has managed to secure few sustainability achievements for the company, including the Edge Props Malaysia's Responsible Developer Building Sustainable Development Award 2021 and Malaysia Rating Corporation Berhad Sustainability Award 2020. He is also an award winner, bagging five OSH Gold Awards from Malaysian so Society of Occupational Safety and Health Academically, Mr. Razif obtained his degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Wollongong, Australia. The topic of his speech is 
towards a sustainable township beyond the bricks and mortar. Towards a sustainable township beyond the bricks and mortar. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Muhammad Razif, Muhammad Yusuf. Assalamualaikum and uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank uh, David and David's team, Veritas, for inviting Sam W to uh, to this event. Um, today, I would like to share with you on um, uh, towards sustainability, sustainable township, but not so much. You know, all the six seven elements. I'm just taking one element out of uh, six seven. So that we go a little bit deeper into one element that Sam Dabi Property believes strongly in. And also to share a little bit under the hood some of the drama behind <laughs> trying to get to where we want. Um, we've seen uh, from I.R. Ahmad's uh, earlier slide around 39% of global emissions come from our industry. And that's a lot, uh, and um, it is not enough. A lot of the things that we do now, I believe, is insufficient for us to get to uh, net zero, and therefore we have to accelerate it. Uh, we believe um, with the slides that we share, we'll give you a little bit of um, thought or, or nuggets uh, um, that we need to do things beyond the bricks and uh, mortar. Uh, at the bottom, you can see our operational carbon emission is about 35,000 uh, 35 tons, 35, tons uh, a year. But actually, uh, what uh, is um, the real challenge is the one below, embodied, uh, embodied carbon. Uh, if you can imagine the screen behind me, this is actually, we, we did a scale of our operational carbon and embodied carbon. And what we have found is, um, what we have found is, the operational carbon is only on this green part, and our three thousand homes that we build every year, embodied carbon is about that much to scale, yeah. And that's not including, you know, the infrastructure that we build, we do earthwork, uh, land use change, and it's a lot more. Uh, it's a lot more than that. Therefore, there's a lot of things we developers need, need to be aware of now because we need to invest now in order for the planet to be healthy in the future. But we cannot uh, do that. As an organization, I believe we cannot do that if people are not excited, if Sime W property staff is, uh, does not have a sense of uh, purpose. So we recently launched the one on the left. Uh, if you look at our purpose about multiplying value, people, business, economy, and planet. And we want everybody to really believe in these four elements of people, business, economies, and planet. Um, uh, where we, you can go green and still make, uh, and still make money. At the same time, uh, you need to multiple, multiply your value by really understanding your, um, that that to reach to where you want to reach net zero, you cannot do it alone. And you depend on others to help you to get there. <clears throat> so uh, on, the, on your right hand side, you can see the self-sufficient township, right? The two, four, five, six uh, uh, elements that, that is part, uh, part of it. Uh, if we are doing business as usual, we will never get to self-sufficient township. So what we did was together with uh, Pertubo Han Architect Malaysia, um, Malaysian Institute of Architect, uh, where we had a competition, 100 over uh, architect companies uh, submitted um, proposals to us. And it was really an, uh, an eye-opener for us on how we can get to net zero with so many innovative uh, ideas. The messaging here is business as usual will not get us there. Of course, all of us uh, know that. Um, these are the two, four, six elements of uh, self-sufficient township. I will cover only this one today, the green part, ecology and uh, environment. Uh, and and it, it doesn't stand on its own. It will cut across a bit of energy, water, climate, it will cut across a bit of the community piece, but primarily it's the green part. Uh, 
Uh, and whenever you talk about it, uh, of course, you talk about uh, biodiversity. Um, it is actually new for me. I'm an engineer, right? It's a new education for me to understand what biodiversity is. It's about what you see there, variety of living species on Earth. The key word is, is uh, variety. And I will share with you some of the faults that we have made in the, uh, in the past. And then when you go into urban biodiversity, our organization was educated, we, we hired uh, a full-time ecology, and he said that the variety and variability among living uh, organi uh, uh, organisms, you know, in, in an urban setting, etc. And uh, that is not uh, some W properties uh, development, but um, I can bet you a few of our old developments are like that. There's no variety there, right? And that's bad for the environment. The flora, the fauna will not... Uh, you do not encourage the development of flora and fauna. So if, if we continue business as usual, then you will keep seeing what we are seeing now, the, uh, the flooding, etc. I think I, I won't repeat what the earlier speakers have been saying. And if you look at how we do earthwork, right? The, the land use change, the... Um, where you take away soil, healthy soil, and how do you regenerate that? And I'm a little bit optimistic now with the knowledge we know now that we can play a role, but we have to be really serious uh, about it. And uh, the five threats, um, you can see for yourself, uh, land use change is one that we worry about. Uh, climate change, everybody, it's in everybody's attention. But what caught us by surprise was this part here, invasive species and, what was it? Invasive species, okay, uh, not so much the disease, invasive species. Um, we never paid attention to it um, until, until recently, and we happily have a park here that you can see on your right side, and, uh, and Wetlands International said this is one of the most promising park that we, uh, uh, that we have. Uh, then our ecologists then say, uh, boss, uh, uh, actually the trees behind are very invasive. Uh, you plant that trees and will kill all the other local trees. It's an Australian, uh, it's an Australian acacia, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, my point here is that we, we need to build up our knowledge. And it was also a new learning experience for our landscape, uh, landscape architects, uh, going through this journey of understanding biodiversity better. Um, so, um, with this knowledge, armed with this knowledge, I think the organization now is more uh, confident of our ability, uh, our meaning not scientific property, humanity's ability to be able to, to regenerate biodiversity. Um, and I would like to share with you a bit of our experience, a bit of our, our challenges and the organizational thinking or changes that needs to happen. So um, this is the co uh, public commitment we, we make in the Star, our, new, our local newspaper. And why is it important to make public commitment? Then you sort of tie the top management, you need to act on it. So we say that uh, we are committed to biodiversity conversation, uh, conservation, and it is through tree planting and reforestation. Uh, we, we have matured a little bit beyond that now. Uh, at the same time, we are also looking at uh, a certain percentage of our, our, the trees that we plant are endangered, rare and threatened uh, species. So I'm going to take an example of city of uh, Elmina along the Gatri Highway on how we do planning, implementation and monitoring and share with you a little bit of the challenges that we face along the way. I work for a Dutch company for 25 years and Dutch are very, very... Uh, enterprising. The, the, so, um, so whatever they do, business comes first. And uh, they have a strong belief that you can both be green and uh, be green and make money at the same time. And uh, sometimes properties will be like that, fortunately, and that aligns with my value. Uh, I put in those 2014, 2016, 2022, showing that if the development you do, it's a bit more expensive to do a green, uh, green development. But the, 
uh, acceptance by uh, homeowners and whatnot is very, very good. Um, and those are tumultuous times, as you can see in the last uh, 10 years. Um, leadership is very important. Uh, the commitment has to come from the top. And if the term, I'm going to use my boss term, he called it the force uh, for good. Uh, in my simple interpretation of force for good is when you want to do something, you sincerely want to do it. Uh, it is not because you want your annual report to look good. It's not because you want to meet science-based target, etc. It is really because you want to do it good for people, planet, business, economy, etc. And Dalai Lama also says something about uh, uh, force for good. is about uh, that genuine action. And that is what... Um, that is what I feel that that sincerity, that genuine intent for us to uh, make the planet a better place. It has to be, uh, the Malay call it ikhlas, it has to be uh, genuine. <clears throat> um, so these are some numbers of, uh, of Elmina uh, uh, master plan. You can see if, how, how much land we sacrifice for local parks. There's a waterway that goes from left to right, etc. And uh, we plant a lot of uh, trees. Um, and as a result, um, the animals uh, like it. Um, we spotted the critically endangered pangolin, right? Please don't take a picture and send to your uh, friends who might catch it. Um, and because it's critically endangered, we slowly had to send it back to the, to the forest next door. Uh, the forest next door also has the Malayan tape. This one is found two kilometers in into our development and otters are very, very picky about clean water. So it's a good indication that the water is, uh, is clean. Um, so, and we have a lot more of these kind of photographs either by uh, township communities or by our staff that shows that if you provide the right um, environment or infrastructure, the animal, uh, township, uh, communities and uh, flora and fauna can coexist. So what do we do? We are... Uh, let us be very clear. We are polluting business. We use cement that, that uh, you know, emit a lot of carbon, steel, etc. We, we do earth work. But the more educated we are, we meaning some W property, the more educated we are, the more we reckon we can regenerate, regenerate the biodiversity loss. Uh, first and foremost is knowledge. Uh, we need to have that knowledge. And that knowledge, we do not have. And what we did was we partnered with an NGO, Tropical Rainforest uh, Conservation and Research Center, and provide them with an infrastructure where they can, um, uh, they can plant trees, uh, they have nursery, they can do their research. Um, do, in 2021, we, uh, uh, TRCRC educated 6,000 people, mostly through webinar. And that they continue to educate people about conservation of uh, forests. Having a partnership like this, uh, a technical expert who is not only an NGO that you look at as a second class citizen, we look at the NGO as an equal, uh, equal partner. So uh, sometimes they also scold us. Why are you doing like this? Why are you planting, uh, planting uh, this way? Uh, we, um, the way we put uh, leaves, the way we manage our leaves, the way we manage our soil, we have had tons of criticism from them. Uh, we can say this is our land and then, okay, um, and, and not take their advice, but we do take their advice. Uh, i give you an example where we wanted to do this forest, uh, forest park in Elmina City. And then they say, hey, uh, I don't think you're planting enough, uh, enough trees. Uh, and uh, we, we sat down with them, we plan again and, and, and say, okay, what are the right species that we want to put? So in the future, this will be a lot more dense than what you see, uh, what you see here. Uh, so an NGO is, is fairly independent, giving them that respect 
giving them that space for them to criticize us, to slap us a bit in the face. It's actually very helpful. It's a very professional, uh, professional uh, relationship. Uh, it is not easy. Uh, when uh, sometimes when they they scold you, okay, you you feel a bit uh, a bit a bit hot. But when you think about it, when uh, it is about the planet, you do take that into into account. So um, this is a bit more mature than the previous photograph. Um, these are primarily endangered, rare, and thre thre threatened species. Um, so part of the model is they sell, sell back to, to us all the trees that they, they plant. <clears throat> so this uh, two kilometers from the edge of the forest to inside our property, we have a, a beautiful park. Um, hold on, sorry. A beautiful park where w uh, Wetlands International commissioned a study and say that this is the most promising of all our parks. Only for us to realize later it has invasive Acacia species. Uh, we brought people there and everybody had a wow moment. This is very beautiful. And, um, and, uh, and we can actually leave the in invasive Acacia species and nobody would know better but the company decided that we need to do something uh, about it. So we're working with our NGO, what are the best species to replace uh, invasive species. In another park, we brought our uh, finance department, right? Uh, for Lawatan uh, Tapak, uh, what do you call that? Uh, for site visit, right? So we brought them and then, okay, here's some uh, fish, uh, fish feed, and then they, fish, uh, they feed the fish, right? And happily, all this koi came up, right, uh, to, to the surface. And true enough, our ecology then say, boss, this is an invasive species. So that's a bit of a problem on what we're going to do there. Um, uh, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is uh, knowledge is very important. Expertise, uh, whether you got in-house or uh, external, you do need those expertise uh, to, to help you. And if you look at the earlier one around Force for Good, that leadership uh, piece as an umbrella to help push the uh, agenda. We want to rewild, uh, we want to rewild uh, Elmina. And um, let me just show you what we mean by that. So we have uh, an opportunity to, um, if you look at, we have forests on one side and, and the way that we develop, we call it biodiversity, but they're all fragmented. And again, we've been, we've been taught that you need to connect them via an ecological uh, connection or ecological connectivity. Um, uh, just checking my time. Uh, e ecological connect connectivity and therefore part of the plan now is to connect ecologically from the left side to the right side right up so that the author and, and animals can actually uh, enjoy uh, the, the space. <clears throat> Knowing what tree species is very important so um, we our old thinking in many of our development was we needed our development to look pretty. <laughs> uh, and therefore, um, what's pretty? Pretty is neat trees, very well manicured. Uh, we do not take into account the biodiversity. And, um, and now we say, okay, enough of that. We are going to ensure there is biodiversity. If you look at uh, outside this window, is a good example of hey nampa uh, when you look at it it's like biodiverse right it's different trees uh, so my ecology will say no uh, you have to have uh, multiple layers I forgot the name right? first layer second layer and then canopy and emergent layer on top uh, that will encourage birds and then some of the animals at the bottom and um, and that is what we are working towards in all our uh, development. Um, this is an uh, yeah, eco-forest trail. It's actually in government's land, um, working with um, the, water board, uh, the Water Authority, Luas, is it? And then the other one is working with Forestry Department. 
And um, and as you can see, we we educate uh, people that go in there. They need uh, they need permit. Um, the point I would like to make here is stakeholder uh, engagement. Um, so at one end, we want as a a community that stays in a sustainable township, and uh, and. To, to get there, it is not just providing the infrastructure. You need uh, the whole ecosystem, the authorities, uh, etc., to be to be engaged. Uh, this is credit to the Sam Dabi property team. Um, they always have engagement with government folks uh, because we really want to understand oh, what are the agenda. Uh, so the first thing that we that struck us was. Hey, janganlah tanam pokok banyak-banyak. Hey, don't plant a lot of trees uh, because uh, our maintenance costs will shoot through the roof, uh, right? And that's an ongoing education uh, where we say that uh, the more, the more, uh, sorry, dense planting in the next few years, you virtually have no uh, maintenance. Uh, so that's again the knowledge, uh, managing the stakeholder, what's good for the planet, multiplying value all uh, come into the picture. And you can see all their, uh, all their agenda. At one end, uh, the government does say that, hey, we want to be you know, 2050 or 2030 by you know, uh, net zero, etc. But at the other end, the, the people on the ground executing that, uh, require, uh, they say, I want more lawns, which is bad for uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, I want less trees. Uh, there's even one, I think, something about uh, planting distance. Can you make sure that you plant your trees very, very far? So those, those stakeholders' needs, concerns must be, uh, must be addressed through continuous engagement. Um, education, I think, is nothing new. Many corporates uh, do this, and we educate people about conserving, uh, uh, conserving the rainforest. Um, we have not reached a stage of having citizen scientists, uh, the movement that's gaining a, a bit of traction. Uh, my team is uh, uh, exploring, can we get into that movement where uh, people actually um, either get some kind of data on the trees that you plant, etc. I don't know how it works. It sounds uh, exciting. What you can see here are students. Um, that is uh, Maybank on the bottom left-hand corner and uh, from the community leader, the one at the bottom, <coughs> uh, bottom in the middle. So in, in uh, summary, um, for us to move towards a self-sustaining township is a long journey. Uh, and I've just shared with you one of the, you know, that six elements that uh, comprise a, uh, comprise of um, uh, a, a self-sustaining uh, township. Um, you need a lot of resources. You need that stamina, you need that persistence, you need commitment from the top. Um, the purpose for your staff must be very, very clear. It is very clear in our mind, we're doing this because we are multiplying value for people, business, economy, and the, and the planet. Uh, never forget the stakeholders. They um, sometimes, um, you know, uh, they don't disturb you while you sort of own that, that development and you can a bit do what, what you want to do, and, uh, but keep them uh, engaged on your plan so that it, it won't catch you uh, in the future. Um, I hope I, I have given you a little bit of a picture of how triple, what do you call triple bottom line works, uh, where you need to look at the people, planet, profit, uh, aspect at one go. Uh, and is it bad for your business? No, as you can see from the sales that we have uh, over, uh, over the decade. Uh, uh, so I hope uh, that gives you a bit of, uh, under the hood, uh, a picture of uh, a company that wants to uh, do good for the planet, who sincerely believe in, in force for good. It starts from a purpose, the leadership behind it, uh, an, excited, uh, an ex excited set of people uh, learning from everyone uh, they can externally, uh, internally, uh, unlearning and relearning uh, along the way, uh, making mistakes along the way, and most importantly, a company that puts money behind uh, behind making the planet uh, a better place. Uh, with that, thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Muhammad Razif, Muhammad Yusuf. Coming up next, the seventh speaker of the day is Mr. Raymond Ram. He is an advocate against economic crime as a certified fraud examiner, certified anti-money laundering specialist, and ISO 37001 ABMS lead auditor. With a master's degree in economic crime management, bachelor's degree in psychology, and certificate in corporate governance by the Basel Institute of Governance, Switzerland. He is currently pursuing his doctorate in business administration in Malaysia. He has spearheaded the development of Transparency International Malaysia's guidance for good practice and checklist for adequate procedures for the private sector to adopt the ministerial guidelines on adequate procedures. He is currently the founder and managing principal at Grey Matter Forensic Advisory Sanjuan Berhad, a solution based training and consultancy specializing in financial forensics, fraud risk management, and AML slash CFT compliance. He also holds the position of Secretary General at Transparency International Malaysia and serves on the Transparency International's Global Strategy Team and DTIC Governance Working Group, Malaysian Institute of Accountants. The topic of his speech is business integrity management as a core antecedent to our national anti-corruption efforts. Business integrity management as a core antecedent to our national anti-corruption efforts. Before we welcome Mr. Raymond on board, let's have a look at a video from Transparency International. 17 years ago, this was just a pile of rubble. There was nothing, it was flat. The Afghans are very enterprising. So if they're giving the chance, they, they move quickly. The business of the world is the same as the country. The country is the same as the country. Unfortunately, we don't have a good reputation. In some cases, we see that the money that comes to this country is misused and goes to certain pockets. I wanted to be able to get the money from them and I was able to get the money from them, but I couldn't get the money from them. This is Buildings are built uh, by using power, by using force, by bribing. And when we try to report on that, we face dangerous situations. Our investigative reports have been naming and shaming the large uh, mafia of the country in different fields. We have accepted that as a fact of the reporting in these cases. If you walk around the Kabul city, you can observe lots of high-rise buildings which are not built according to norms and standards. Uh, an earthquake could collapse lots of these buildings and it's a threat to public safety. یک دکتر که 24 ساعت نوکری میکنه او در حدود 8000 افغانی معاش داره بالاخره باعث میشه تقاضای پول شود ما از چشم پوشی نمیکنیم و به خاطر نمریشان اونا را توهین تحقیر نکنن و از اونا پول نخواین در صورتی که دولت بخواد ما شما معلمین بلند ببره معلمی نمیتونه که چنین کارایی که اختلاس است از اختلاس کار بگیرن ما ضرورت به سیستم کنترلی خود مملکت داره it depends on the will of the officials. Uh, Afghanistan leaders need to prove to people that they're fighting with corruption. And that it starts from taking the big cases to the court. We should put corruption under the spotlight. We spent about 50% of our national budget to procure. So if we can manage to distribute that equally and impartially and competitively, then they will provide more opportunities for the small medium enterprises to grow up. Initially, we faced the monumental resistance. Uh, we revised the entire system, we revised the entire law to make it more fair. It's a lot better, but we still have a, a way to go. 40 years of war has made a big distance between the citizen and the modernity, and we need to fill that gap. همه با یک صدا نشویم و گلم فساد بر نچینیم فردی کار امکان پذیر نیست
And with that, please join me in welcoming Mr. Raymond Ram. Yes. Test one, two, three, test. Hi, uh, very good morning. Eh, sorry, very good evening. <laughs> My mistake. Yeah, so very good evening, everyone. And yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Raritas, for the kind invitation. Uh, myself, from I'm represent, representing Transparency International Malaysia. Now, the reason behind the video I played before coming on stage. Simple reason. There is an issue, and we do not want to get to a stage where it's irreparable, and we cannot come back to a proper, proper state per se. Right? So the video earlier was by the Global Coalition, Transparency International. We are based in Berlin, our local chapter here in Malaysia. And this video was taken in Afghanistan before the Taliban regime took over. And they were rebuilding after you know, the civil war and things like that. And you could see how bribery corruption deters development, how bribery corruption basically uh, stops development stops a movement of funds to the right parties and things like that. Because a lot of aid was misdirected and moved towards the wrong pockets. And we do not want to get there. Now, my presentation is taking a shift from where we were uh, throughout the conference today. We are moving towards talking about G, right? Governance. The focus of governance and the, the issues that I would like to talk about is business integrity and anti-corruption as a whole, right? Because the idea here is this. ENS will not work if you do not have proper transparency, proper governance, and the right tone from the top that's against bribery and corruption, right? Now, a bit about us. We are basically advocates against corruption. To be honest to you, my, in my day job, I run my own practice. We do uh, financial forensics, fraud risk management, AML, CFT compliance. But as a volunteer, I sit on the board of Transparency International. We give our time because of our passion because we believe that we can make a difference. We have continuously engaged with the government of the day. We do not care who they are, right? And we work with the private sector as well to develop and to promote business integrity throughout the country, right? So my presentation will be focused on the situation in Malaysia, where we are now, where we are going towards, and what needs to be done by the private sector. Because we continuously talk about how the public sector may be corrupt, how certain people may be pocketing certain funds, but we need to also remember that it takes two hands to clap, right? The private sector plays their part as well. And if the private sector are continuously being the givers, obviously you'll have the takers. Now, what is corruption? Just to put things into context, if you look at how the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission has basically defined corruption as the act of giving, receiving any form of gratification or reward. Now, when we say gratification, the idea here is something of value. It's defined under our MACC Act, under Section 3, and it's anything of value in order to procure a particular benefit. And the other definition that I would like to also highlight is, by Transparency International, globally, we define corruption as the abuse of entrusted power for personal gain. As simple as that, right? Is someone misusing their position of power in order to get personal gain by either accepting or giving a certain form of gratification? Now, of course, we've got to start off with the legal side of things. We have good laws in Malaysia. Being a Commonwealth country, our laws mimic the UK Bribery Act as well, right? And UK Bribery Act is known worldwide as the most stringent anti-corruption act in the world. And we have the MECC Act, which criminalizes the act of bribery under section 16 and 17. We have also talked about it in the, or stating it in the penal code as well. Embezzlement under penal code Fraud, extortion, nepotism, favoritism. Because all these are acts of abuse of entrusted power. And it can be criminalized. And mind you, I would like to highlight that at the top part, when we talk about bribery, the act of ac accepting, receiving, soliciting, demanding, if a person attempts to ask for a bribe, it's already an offense. You don't even need to get the particular gratification. If a person promises a bribe, is already an offense. You can be charged twice if you, if you ask and also receive, right? Now, a bit of findings on where we are in Malaysia. 
Now, Bank of Garden Malaysia releases the national risk assessment for anti-money laundering every three years. The latest one that was released this year was the findings in 2020. Mind you, this was before COVID-19. And you know what are the main uh, offences or the main uh, criminal acts which are directly related to money laundering? The one that you see on top. Fraud and corruption. Right? And this is being promoted by the private sector. So, so this, we have a big problem and we can see this. Fraud and corruption being the top forms of criminality directly associated with the act of money laundering. Right? There's many other issues if we talk about money laundering. But without putting a stop to this, we will get nowhere. The ESG agenda even can't move forward if we do not go towards the root cause or towards making sure that this is indeed looked after first. Now, putting, putting us on a map per se, at Transparency International, we also come up with something known as the Corruption Perceptions Index. Right? We are continuously hit by the government of the day if we fall in ranking. Of course, if we go up, then we are applauded. Lah. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not in our control in any way. You know? The Malaysian chapter has no control on where Malaysia stands in the CPI index, which we have continuously mentioned to the government. <laughs> Basically, our coalition would collate data from around the world, from 180 countries, and determine what is the level of perception of public sector corruption within these countries. And if we look at Malaysia, sorry if I'm covering it, we have been falling down the rank since 2019. Right? If you can see now, we are even scoring. If you see the score, the higher the score, the better. Right? So to 100, earlier we talked about carbon score, now we talk about CPI score, 1 to 100. 1 to 100, the higher the better. Then you have the ranking. The lower the ranking, better, because number 1 is perceived to be least corrupt, while number 180 is perceived to be most corrupt. Now where is Malaysia? We are scoring below 50 over 100. We have dropped below 50 and our rank has gone to 62 over 180. You know, where does that, that put Malaysia at the moment? What are countries that we are co being compared with when it comes to bribery and corruption? These are the countries that we're being compared with. We do have a problem that we need to address, right? And we continuously talk to the government about it. And now we have laws which have also put the onus on the private sector, which I'll discuss in the following slides. And that would help also the private sector to now invest into proper anti-bribery and corruption measures. Now, like I, coming back to this slide here, if you look at where Malaysia is, we are being compared to countries like Croatia, Namibia, Jordan, Greece, which are doing better than us. Right? So, and we do not know where we will be in the next CPI score, which will be released in January of 2023. And I don't know, hopefully we come up. And this would someday put us in the category of high-risk countries. Do we want that? Do we want to be doing business with other companies globally and being marked as a high-risk country? This would make that happen if we do not do something about it. Right? Now, going towards businesses and their roles. Of course, COVID-19 hit. Business struggled, especially SMEs. If, if you've saw, seen in the newspapers, the number of SMEs that had to close shop because of COVID-19, you see that desperation was there. And human beings, when you push them to the corner, what happens? They tend to fight back. And when you say tend to fight back, they'll do anything in their power to survive. And if you look at the, the research done by EY here, the latest... Uh, findings that we have. EY Global Integrity Report shows that growing pressure on ethical conduct in emerging markets. 62% of respondents believe that challenging, it's challenging for organizations to maintain integrity standard in difficult economic times. We know how the economy is now. We know the level of inflation. We see what's happening around the world and things are only going to get worse in 2023. What would happen with the level of bribery and corruption? Do we want to end up like certain countries, or do we want to come out of this particular trap? Right, that, that's the particular uh, concern here. Worsening market conditions for 36% and declining financial performance for 31% being top risk for unethical conduct by businesses. 
right? Cutting short, not going, proper pro, uh, not going through proper procurement processes, right? Going towards direct negotiation when you don't need to. All these were issues that were brought up. Now, the effects of corruption was already highlighted in the video I played earlier. Simply put, national security, we can see. I am putting that particular image behind on purpose. It's not randomly put there. I'm not going to mention the case, but it could involve bribery and corruption, and it could endanger people at that particular football stadium if there was a game going on at that time. Right? So we must be very mindful that if you let bribery and corruption become worse, it will affect every stage of the supply chain. And to be honest, in the construction industry, you know it's rampant. Just to let you know a bit of my background, I started off my career in actually corporate insolvency. Right? I was working for a private liquidator before. So we took over developers that had gone insolvent, and we saw the mess that were created in certain companies. Right? Sometimes the, the, how the DOs were approved, how the architect certs were produced, how my progress payments were paid out, even though we can see on-site, piling is not done yet. Simple as that. So actually, that triggered my interest in this particular area and to pursue this particular agenda forward. Because we need to address the root cause before talking about any other concerns going forward. And this can only be addressed if we look at the facts and figures. Right? Next, we look at organizational. The impact to the organization, I would discuss further in the following slides. Why? Because in 2018, we have implemented a new section to our MACC Act, known as Section 17, Capital A, or the Corporate Liability Provision. Now, the private sector, the senior management board directors can be implicated for actions of anyone associated to them. Imagine this. A runner of the company goes and bribes another person to get you an approval for licensing or something. The senior management board directors can go to jail now. And that was already implemented in 2018. They gave a cooling off period in, for two years. In 2020, it has been put in force. And to date, we already have our first case. We already have a company that has been charged under that particular section. Right? Next, of course, individual, we understand that once you've been tainted by bribery corruption, your reputation is gone. And of course, the fines and whatnot comes along as well. Now, if you look at Malaysia's journey, we have done quite a bit when it comes to bribery and corruption. We have done quite a bit to improve Malaysia's integrity. And we have worked since the days of, you know, under British government up till now when we established the Integrity Institute, up till 2018 when the new government took over at that time, we had implemented a national anti-corruption plan, or the NACP for short. And today we have initiatives of the NACP being implemented. Hopefully we continue implementing the initiatives, right? We are pressuring the government to make sure that this plan goes on as it is. And we have continuous engagement with GIACC, which is the uh, custodian for this, to make sure that they inform the public what's going on. What initiatives has been implemented, what has not, and why are certain initiatives stalled, right? That is the National Anti-Corruption Plan. I can't really go into that in detail because of time. Now, one of the major areas within the NACP is, of course, corporate governance. The one place that we all can play a part here, right? When we say corporate governance, you're talking about how a company practices business ethics, business integrity in the course of operations, in the course of moving forward, even with the agenda of ESG. Besides that, of course, we have other initiatives covering other sectors within the NACP. Now, this is highlighting the particular amendment to the Act that I want to talk about today. Section 17, capital A, it's basically a puzzle, a gap that we had in Malaysia, and we have fulfilled that. That particular gap is now criminalizing organizations for the actions of anyone associated to them, right? And this is not only staff. It's anyone acting on your behalf. If they commit an act of bribery, the company will be liable as well. The senior management of that company and the board directors can be liable for the acts of that particular person. Enacted in 2018, and the idea here, like I said before, it takes two hands to clap. We cannot continuously point the finger towards the public sector when it comes to bribery corruption, because now we have put the onus on the private sector as well to do their part. 
Now, these are the amendments made to our MACC Act back in 2018. If you can see here, the ones that I'm trying to highlight here is Section 17, Capital A, where an offence committed by a commercial organisation has been included. Right? Of course, the others uh, we don't need to pay too much concern about. Section 41A is more for the MACC offices, not for our private sector per se. Now, this is the provision that I would like to highlight and make sure everyone here is continuously adopting proper preventive measures to make sure this doesn't happen. And the provision basically highlights this. A CO, any CO, any commercial organization, commits an offence if a person associated. Now, the term person associated is quite wide, you know. You don't even need an agreement with that particular person. Huh? You don't need a formal agreement. That means if some, a runner, like I said, you have just got him for the day to go and do a small job for you, he's already a person associated. Imagine the level of risk now. Right? So, and corruptly gives, agrees to give, even if you promise. If I get a WhatsApp or if, the, if MACC gets an email of you sending a particular public official, for example, promising them a certain gift, a certain all-expense-paid trip, or even cash money, that's already an offence. You're already liable, right? And A and B, if you look at A, to obtain retain business, and B, to obtain retain advantage. Now, you don't even need to read A. B is enough. Forget reading A, because it's any form of advantage. And if MACC comes in and raids the company, their question is simple. I don't care if you have a formal agreement with this particular person that has committed the act. Who benefited from it? And if it's a company who benefited from it, you're liable. Right? So now what happens if you are found to be liable under the Act? This is what happens. If you look at the individual level there, sorry if I'm blocking it, the giver that gives on an individual basis is given a penalty of five times the value of gratification, the value of what was given, or 10,000, whichever higher and 20 years jail. But those that did not give it directly, those at the top of organizations, will be fined 10 times the value of gratification or 1 million, whichever higher, not lower. Yeah? So imagine it's a 50 ringgit bribe and you're fined 1 million. So it's quite, it's quite hefty. And for SMEs, you can close shop. Huh? This for larger organizations still makes sense. For SMEs, you can close shop if you get a fine like this and 20 years in jail. Can you imagine a runner that has given a bribe and then the director gets taken to jail for 20 years when he did not give it directly, but of course, he had benefited from it, right? So what do organizations do in this instance per, per se? So if a person is charged under Section 17, Capital A, this new provision, what do senior management here, the Mr. Manager, Mr. Director do? What is their defense? Two things they need to prove. Number one, they need to prove that they, did not, they are not part of the crime. They did not give the approval for that particular bribe. Number one. There is no intent. Number two, you must prove that you had in place proper adequate procedures. We've been repeating adequate procedures for quite some time. And we hope all organizations have done their part in putting in place proper adequate procedures. What is adequate procedures? Proper preventive measures against bribery and corruption. Proper controls to make sure your persons associated do not get involved in such acts in the first place. If I cannot prove these two things, I get taken to jail. If I cannot prove these two things, I get fined. Right? So there is a need for investment into adequate procedures. So that, that's what I'm saying. Make sure that when we talk about ESG on the governance side of things, you have to talk about adequate procedures now. We at Transparency International have done roadshows, we have done awareness programs, we have even worked with companies to implement this particular, uh, this particular set of rules, set of preventive measures to make sure they are now ready in case of anything. This is what we mean by adequate procedures. Because every time we say adequate procedures, uh, it quite, it's quite... Uh, a thing like that. But in Malaysia, we love acronyms. So we made sure that we came up with a document which had the TRUST acronym there, T-R-U-S-T. 
Number one, if you see, you need to prove you had top-level commitment. How do you prove this? Having proper, uh, proper duties, responsibilities of the board directors. The senior management has been done. You have reviewed your corruption risk. You have reviewed your controls. You have looked at the audit findings. You have played your part and you have delivered the message of anti-corruption in the organization. The next one is committing to having a risk assessment done. You need to have proper risk assessment done because the word adequate procedures, most of the time when we do even training like this or talks like this, people ask us, how adequate is adequate? No, it's proportionate to your risk because every industry has their own risk of bribery and corruption. Construction is different, right? Oil and gas is different. Retail is different. Where are your risks and what kind of controls do you put in? And the number three is the controls that you put in place, either financial, non-financial controls, your anti-bribery policies. Number four is making sure that it's systematically reviewed, continuously reviewed and reassessed for the level of coverage that it has. And number five, making sure training and communication is done not only for individuals within the organization, but also those associated to the organization as well. So making sure all trust principles are covered is how we maintain proper, adequate procedures. And how TI, TI Malaysia has done this, uh, in a sense, how TI Malaysia would like to help the private sector. I have also just recently spoke at a healthcare conference, <laughs> now at the ESG conference. We had worked with stakeholders from the private sector, also with the law enforcement, to come up with a checklist or with a book per se. Right? So I personally spearheaded the project at TI to come up with a checklist of adequate procedures to assist organizations. Publicly available free document. For auditors, it makes it easier for you because we've got QR codes inside which give you working papers as well. And it's all free of charge. Organizations can use this to implement proper controls and make sure they have everything at par, right? Now, the rationale behind adequate procedures, like I said, it's a process. It's an ongoing process that must be done, must be reviewed and continuously revised based on the level of risk that the organization faces. Because no organization would stay stagnant. You grow, right? Without, I mean, every organization, if you don't grow, you die. So, of course, as you grow, your level of risk would increase in different segments, either in different jurisdictions, in your, I mean, association with public sector officials or anyone of such. Hence why we need to make sure that the adequate procedures is continuously revised, continuously reviewed on an ongoing basis. So if anything happens, you need to prove that this is all fulfilled. These are some of the guidance material I would like to leave you all with as well. Now, we have the first ISO, right? Of course, when you talk about ISO before this, it's all quality management, right? Quality systems. But now we have the first ISO on anti-bribery and corruption very timely with our corporate liability provision with 17 capital A. That is known as 37001, anti-bribery management systems. Companies can get certified as ISO ABMS, as ISO 37001. If you do not want to go for certification, never mind. You can also use the guidance to direct you on what to do, on controls to implement, how to deal with your third parties. Very comprehensive. So please refer to 37001. Another one here is something that I'm continuously promoting because it's not been talked much. We have issued another ISO to complement this, which is ISO 37002, Whistleblowing Management System. Now we have an international standard for whistleblowing because there's only two ways any form of fraud or corruption can be disclosed or can come to surface for investigation. Two ways only. Number one, either red flags has been discovered because of your controls, Number two is tips through whistleblowing. And if we do not, do not continuously encourage people to whistleblow in Malaysia, we won't get those tips. We won't get this information. And to be honest, we at TI now are working closely with Bayou, with the Minister of uh, Law, to make amendments to our Whistleblower Protection Act in Malaysia, which would soon include internal whistleblowing to be given protection. That's something we are fighting for, and hopefully we will get it done as soon as next year. And now we will even afford protection for internal whistleblowers as well. The next one is United Nations Global Compact Risk Assessment Guide. This is something that we can use again as guidance 
And the MECC also used this to when they developed their CRM approach or the corruption risk management approach. So these are certain documents that can come up or you can use as guidance in, to develop your corruption risk management approach per se. These are local resources which we have done, we have come up with. TI Malaysia, either we have come up with it on our own, like the first guidance checklist that we have come up with. The next one, we have also come up with an employer's handbook. Yeah, because I'm in charge for the corporate liability side when it comes to TI Malaysia. And we came up with a handbook for SMEs in four different languages. Even I'm not good in four different languages. Mandarin, Tamil, Basa Melayu, and also English to help SMEs understand the, the, the provision and what do we mean by adequate procedures. So we're trying our best to make sure that everyone puts this in place. The next one is something that we work with the Institute of Integrity Malaysia. We have come up with a standard module. If you would like to train your business associates, we have come up with a standard module. And we are also working on something known as the Corporate Integrity System Management, which has recently been published at IIM, at Institute of Integrity. This is, again, another means for you to adopt adequate procedures. It's just another document, per se, uh, to give you a gist of what we mean by managing the risk of bribery corruption in your organization. Right? So that's basically what I wanted to pre present today. And how is it related to ESG? Simply put, it falls under governance. Right? ENS will not work if you do not put in place G and making sure business ethics, anti-bribery corruption is mitigated. I won't say eradicated. Huh? I will never say that bribery corruption can be stopped fully. I mean, unless you, you only have AIs working for you, lah, right? Or robots working for you. Human beings are still there. But we've got to mitigate the risk as much as possible. And do not fall into the wrong category that we do not want to be in later on, right? With that, I would like to say thank you so much for your time and I hope I managed to deliver something to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Coming up next, the last speaker of the day is Mr. Chong Wai Hong. Mr. Chong joined OCBC Bank in 2021 as Chief Transformation Officer responsible for overall coordination of strategic transformation initiatives as well as driving the bank's concerted sustainability and digital agendas. A technologist by training and banker by profession, his previous experience includes management consulting, IT and operations, retail banking and commercial banking spanning Malaysia, Singapore and Philippines. OCBC Bank Malaysia Berhad aspires to be a leading sustainability financier in Malaysia, most notably partnering Bursa Malaysia in the hashtag financing for ESG initiative to encourage mainstream adoption of sustainable finance and further accelerate PLC's sustainability agendas. In support of the Malaysian government's commitment towards achieving carbon neutrality by year 2050, the OCBC group targets to achieve 50 billion worth of Singapore dollar in sustainable financing commitment by 2025 and OCBC Malaysia is aiming for 15% of its financing portfolio to be sustainability related by 2025. The topic of his speech is doing well by doing good, climate resilience and sustainable financing. Doing well by doing good, climate resilience and sustainable financing. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Chong Wai Hong. Testing, testing, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, very good afternoon. So pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much to uh, David and his team, Veritas team to, to invite OCBC. Uh, I was very impressed with a few uh, speakers before me. I learned a lot of things. Of course, a little bit of fear factor from the transparency in, uh, indicator, you know, the, the, the jailing and the fines, right? So it reminds me of when I was working in the finance industry in Singapore. The first day I arrived in Singapore, I was sat down by the chief compliance officer. He go through everything that can get me in jail for five years or 300,000 fine, right? So, so I think it's, uh, it's pretty important to, to uphold the governance side. 
Of course, from the time of Darby, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, also heartened to, to know about the, uh, the, the matter about the biodiversity. I'll touch in very brief uh, what banks are looking at that. Of course, from the carbon score as well. So uh, I, I'm not a climatologist, neither am I an engineer, but I'm a banker. So today, I'll try to skew as much as possible to how is it relevant for you? Because I think you all deal with the bankers, you know, for your projects. And, uh, you know, the bankers are asking more and more things these days, right? I'll share, share with you why and how. And more importantly, uh, how is it going to be in the next three to five years? Because there's a lot of rev relevance in there. Yeah. So in, in my uh, slide, I will move between sustainability and climate financing. Uh, so climate resilience. Climate resilience is increasingly uh, uh, is pushed to the to the to the mainstay of the focus for the banks. You know, especially in the next one or two years. ESG has been around for them uh, for quite a while. Uh, banks have looked at ESG. Uh, importantly, I think uh, you kind of noted. You know, in, in the in the news. Uh, ESG risk is transferring into real business risk, right? So I'm not here, as mentioning climatologists, I'm not here to say, you know, 1.5% Celsius is real, not real. I'm just saying that from a bank standpoint, it is real business risk, right? So you may have noticed, as, uh, as I hinted earlier, you know, we have uh, uh, rubber, glove pro, uh, rubber glove manufacturers, we have palm oil issues and so on and so forth. It's a geopolitical uh, matter as well, yeah? So let me just go through these slides in terms of that, right? So. This is uh, bankers. We always start with numbers. So uh, numbers only make sense to us. So, so you know, from a Munich Re standpoint, you know, last year, uh, they were looking at a, uh, a what do you call, a total loss about 280 billion US dollars. This is related to natural disasters, right? And of course, with climate as well. So even if you take out geophysical events like earthquake, I don't think we can do much about earthquake, right? Short of seis seismic uh, uh, things, right? If you take the rest, arguably, some are th these are around climate uh, events. Some is controllable, some are, some are legacy and so on. And the, the, the geophysical part is actually quite small, less than 10 billion out of this, the whole, this whole picture. So it's becoming a concern for sure. It's also becoming uh, something that the regulations are pushing the banks and the banks reacting in a way that will impact the clients as well. Yeah. So, so here is very much on the climate change. So climate change is something that uh, has accelerated in the last two, three years from a banking standpoint. I think when banks work with uh, developers, we have been looking at environmental uh, uh, aspects for many, many years. Even when I started banking, almost like 30 years ago, right? We have always, from developers, we always ask for EIAs, right? Environmental impact assessments. It's not as if we, we do not know that's very important, but collectively, because of the government's commitment, the COP26 uh, as well, uh, Malaysia has signed up to zero base emission by net zero by 2050, right? And all the banks in Malaysia, through the Association Banking Malaysia, has similarly committed to uh, net zero by 2050. Now for banks, if you go through some of the external statistics, we are, we are technically um, a big, uh, uh, what do you call, offender in a sense. Because they are saying that what we are financing in the economic activities has about 700 fold of impact on carbon emission compared to our own. For a bank standpoint, we have basically our branches, our head office, and so on. We can do so much, you know, about turning off the aircon, making sure it's GBI, and so on and so forth. But our book financing and the soft stream is so the one financing all the economic activity, and that is where regulations are coming down on the banks. Yeah, and the regulations here is very much on climate, uh, as mentioned to start with, because the, the, the governance and sustainability, other aspects, has always, always been in the background anyway. Yeah? So, so JC3, uh, you may have heard about this, is a joint uh, uh, committee for climate change, is taking effect. So starting from this year, for all of you who deal with uh, bankers, right, the relationship managers probably come to you and ask you to fill up a lot more checklists. Right? Because, because starting this year, the first submission in July, we are supposed to already rank all our loan books, our lending facilities to the construction, uh, and the, all industries, not just construction, right? And going through all this client, a client level and each facility level, whether it is climate friendly, whether it's climate transition, or basically it's just in the other bucket that we need to figure out what to do with. Okay, and that's called CCPT. Yeah? And, and tied to that, of course, in the second item, um, is what the banks will have to go through in the next two years, the climate risk uh, management uh, scenario analysis. So when, when we need to do this, what we do is we have to go into our loan books again, our, our, our investments, we call it books. And we need to start assessing all these different uh, industries that we are financing 
as uh, mentioned, whether it's green, whether it's not, whether it's susceptible to climate risk. So we're saying that, for example, you know, if we are, we are financing a piece of land somewhere or residential project somewhere that's prone to flood, right? We have to go down to that level. So we're looking for geo GPS information. We're looking at postcode information. It's not good enough, right? We eventually need to be able to get into that few houses that we 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 are supposed to find. We are financing to understand whether it's in the catchment where it's actually the water or you know will will will, will impact when doing flooding times, right? And from that standpoint, look into the risk. And when we look into the risk, two things will happen, right? From bank, from the regulation standpoint, it require us to put more capital against that or it will shape the behavior of the banks to not finance that. And as, as mentioned, I, I'm trying to make it relevant to you because this is where the banks are going to come eventually. You know, if, if we work on certain projects that has inherent risk, you know, in, you know uh, that, that inherent climate risk or flooding risk, you know, to, in a sense, you know, you will find more and more banks will be turning, turning away. And as the banking industry come together to try to get all this different information being uh, put in. We're working with rating agencies, we're working with uh, uh, external providers, as mentioned, geolocations and so on, to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, the third one is the task force, the TCFD. Uh, TCFD is something that the uh, central bank is asking all the banks and through the, uh, uh, the, the banks to influence our clients as well, the disclosure around cli uh, climate-related uh, financial disclosure. So by 2024, or rather the reporting in 25, all banks need to report this. And when we start reporting this, we have to go through our loan book, as mentioned. You know, our, our lending facilities, our clients, which industries, green, not green, within the clients, what sort of facility, and start classifying everything. Yeah, and, and from that standpoint, then, then again, the, 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 the pressure from the regulations, understandably, I'm not saying regulations is always the, 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 the problem, to, is for the banks to start crafting our own strategy which industries do we want to finance? Yeah. So, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's sufficient to say that right now all banks are working on this. Uh, the ESG focus for banks is real because as mentioned, not only is just a do good thing, but it's also very important for us to do well as well. Because if not later, regulations are coming in, you know, we have issues of strategy and so on and so forth, right? And, and that will be basically a, a second fold a complication that we want to avoid. We just want to just do it right, right now, yeah? And the stress test is mentioned, we need to be able to do analytics, run through all the projects that we're financing, try to, try to put in all the different data to see whether which one will be susceptible. If the rainfall doesn't stop in KL, you know, for, for one, two days, like what happened in November last time, right? Some of our branches are so uh, almost underwater. Yeah, so I, I won't uh, dwell too much more on this one. Uh, of course, here, I'll just leave it with you. Um, as mentioned, when banks start looking ESG risk, looking into our customers, thinking about how to uh, focus on strategy and which industry we want to finance, we're also looking at what are the risk factors that will impact the credit risk, right? ESG risk becoming a real credit risk because if we finance clients who are unable to manage their operations, for example, disruption, unable to, to, to uh, uh, manage their costs, uh, manage, uh, unable to uh, protect their communities, Right, the community is very important. I think what like the sign, uh, sign mentioned early, right? We are all banks will be using rating agency and external uh, news news feed coming in, right? It's, I, I don't think it's uh, anything new. We'll be scanning the uh, the news market for any adverse news. If you hear about a particular client, you know, facing some issues, whether with labor, whether with etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, all different things, right? Basically, it, it pops up, and we need to consider that for renewal of the, the facilities moving forward as well. I mean, part and parcel of that. Yeah, and, and of course, there's a physical risk and transition risk. Uh, there's the first part, I think it's quite clear, um, externally driven, yeah, uh, so climate, climate related, right, in terms of the physical, uh, uh, physical risk. And the other, the other transition risk in terms of the ability of any in, in, uh, industry to adapt themselves to be relevant in the future when all of these things come together. Yeah. So next slide is very important. I think a transparency in the international I mentioned as well. Besides climate risk, the overall ESG is being, is being uh, looked at. It's very important on the governance part as well. Yeah, when we do our ESG uh, assessment of corporates as well as uh, uh, SME as well, ev eventually into the smaller micro uh, entrepreneurs as well, we look into all these different aspects in terms of, uh, you know, including uh, the management use, uh, the integrity issues, the rights, and, and so on and so forth, yeah? So next, I just want to share a little bit about this. Now, of course, I mentioned the, the, the challenges 
some of those I'm sure you are very well aware of, but also talk about the opportunities. Now, because of this change, changes in the financing industry, a lot of the banks, whether uh, local, foreign, and so on, is looking at how to um, assertively tra trans transition our own uh, business model to support more sustainability things. Right? By and large, we also want to be part and parcel of this uh, journey with our clients to be able to help them to transition, number one. And second, you know, to help to shape our, 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 as mentioned, our business model to be able to do that. Yeah, and uh, if you notice in the last uh, couple of years, at least right after the pandemic started, I think at that point in time, there's a lot more uh, acceleration in terms of awareness. And tied to that, of course, you know, uh, the banks have been uh, pushing very hard for this as well. The COP26, 25, as mentioned, right? And uh, there's a lot more focus on this one. And uh, if you look at the opportunity there, there's a lot more business uh, that's happening on sustainability. I will attempt to uh, explain a little bit uh, on the different things, but more from a structural standpoint. So at least hopefully you can take back, you know, and think, thinking in terms of when you, when you work with banks, hopefully OCBC, right? In terms of financing need, how do you want to shape some of this discussion? Because the, be the better you know what the bankers are looking for, besides the credit bit, the better you're able to propose something. Because when I sit here learning in the last uh, half, an, uh, half a day, I, I find that there's a lot of solutions in the industry that maybe the bankers are not fully aware of. The carbon score, we know we wanted a carbon score as well. It's coming next year. It's very heartening to, to, to see that as well. Yeah? So by and large, of course, there are bond, uh, green loan and social bonds. Um, so if I were to go here, uh, of course, uh, a commercial break. So we're talking about this one. We're working very closely with uh, Bursa as well as the uh, FTSE index uh, to be able to uh, jointly assess uh, the, the ESG risk for all clients moving, moving forward. Now, busy slide. I only need you to look at the top two uh, uh, labels up there. So for financing facilities from a banking standpoint, essentially there's only two big groups of facilities we're looking at. Right? Number one, green, social, sustainable, you know, in this sense, are basically any financing we, we do, whether it's bond or uh, bilateral, or basically a lending facility that has a very specific ESG purpose. Right? So it's very purpose-based. For example, under the green social sustainability, we'll be able to, uh, uh, with this example later, to support a, a specific project that has very clear ESG uh, intention. And that is called green or social sustainable facility. The other one is uh, more relevant to all of you, actually, is a sustainability-linked uh, facilities. Sustainability-linked facilities are normally we look, look to help with climate transition, especially, right? How do we, how do we uh, embed, you know, in the next facility that you go for the bank, right? The, some, uh, some elements of the ESG, especially green or social aspects, right? That can qualify this for a climate transition. And this is where I believe, uh, you know, the regulators, the governments all want the banking industry to work together with all the different industries to see how do we help to be part and parcel of the solution, uh, you know, in, in terms of moving people there, yeah? So, uh, of course, you know, if you go for different types of uh, facilities, there will be different guidelines and standards. I won't go through all of this. I think some of you may know this a little bit better than me, but essentially there will, there will be a very important uh, aspect of ensuring the governance is there. I think someone mentioned governance as well. Well, we push for ESG, the governance in terms of the standards, the certification board, the carbon score, for example, are all things we want to be able to, to look externally to, to verify. And uh, that is very important for us. I think you may have heard of this term called greenwashing. Yeah, we also do not want to call it green when it's not really green. And, uh, you know, as bankers, we also rely on external certification bodies to be able to verify that. So next one, I think uh, from uh, OCBC and largely uh, the banking industry as well, right? So we have different um, groups or other purposes within that that we can, we can work on for sustainable financing. For example, renewable energy. So we can, we can look at financing the renew renewable energy portion of, of a development. So development may be large and big and large. Of course, I think Syme has it figured out much better in terms of the whole thing. But there, there may other developers may be opening up new piece of land kind of thing. We may not want to look at the whole piece, but you know, if there are elements of GBI, if there are elements of solar panel, elements of rainwater harvesting, that can be a separate part that we can finance separately. Right? So I think these are opportunities that you can tack on because at the end of the day, we want to help 
the, the clients to transition and every single step matters, right? And, and these are some of the things to look at. Clean transportation, I think it's more on the, if, we've, if, if you want to come to the bank and say you want to uh, finance a fleet of uh, electric vehicles, for example, that kind of qualifies for your, for your own logistic purposes and so on. Uh, as mentioned, sustainable uh, uh, food and so on. And, and then energy efficiency. So we have been financing some manufacturing uh, clients where they're actually changing machines. Right, they're upgrading the machines to be, you know, use half the power of what it used to use. So, so that, that qualifies the sustainability link. So as, as long as the KPIs are clear, there's a before and after that is trackable, can be certified, that kind of falls in there. Pollution prevention and control, etc. sustainable waste management, and, and, by, uh, uh, and uh, so, so on and so forth. So in a way, I'm, I'm trying to say that um, banks are open for business on this one. We are keen. We also want to learn, yes. And how you, how you structure some of your requests and how you structure some of your projects with different elements may qualify for this in a way that, you know, it could be favorable to you as well, yeah? So, okay, so, so these are some of the examples that I kind of mentioned. Uh, I think it's public information. So one green financing case is Edra Solar, okay? So they, we managed to combine two different elements of this. And this is called a, basically a, a green uh, loan in itself, yeah? So the purpose for this one is actually to set up a solar farm, a big uh, 50 megawatt solar farm, where we actually combine with share, opening up part of the land back to the, back to the, um, the, the community there to allow them to do fruit farming pro bono. Right, so it's a combination of both, in a sense, the, the, the element of the uh, record renewable energy element, plus the fact that they, they are also impacting the, uh, the local community there via livelihood and so on. So more and more of this will be being thought out, and you think about it, it's actually, you know, we sit down with the client, try to be creative about it, have the intentions in the right places. I think that was shared by the people, intention in the right places, and try to make a difference in that sense, yeah? And this is something that we're very proud of to be able to work with Edra Solar on that one. And then uh, uh, others, okay, now, that one was mentioned is the green and sustainable loan. This is a sustainable link I, I uh, mentioned early. Yeah? Without going too much into detail, I think that fits into the different portions I mentioned, renewable energy, consumption, carbon footprint. But more importantly, uh, how this is structured, again, in your, in your negotiation with the bank, uh, banks as, as well, we need to be clear on what specific KPIs we are going for. So you can go to a bank, OCBC has mentioned, hopefully, right? And you, you want to go ask for facility, right? Within there, you have to be clear what exactly you're trying to, to, to address in this sustainability link. As mentioned, banks are really open. If you say you have something sustainably linked, right? Of course, need to be material. We'll be very open to consider. So you have specific KPIs, energy usage, wastewater treatment, uh, you know, maybe like in the era solar cases, uh, benefit, benefits for the community and so on. As long as you have the before and after the KPIs agreed on, then we are able to embark on this one. And, uh, you know, for, for us, it, it, classif uh, it um, qualifies as an ESG or, or a climate transition uh, type of uh, business as well. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, with that, it's a little bit more cost because we need to verify and certify uh, every, every year in terms of uh, whether you're meeting the KPIs and so on. And in some cases, uh, um, again, not in all cases, some cases, if, you, if you're consistently able to meet the KPIs, there'll be pricing differentiation. Right, basically, if you don't meet it, you know, we're gonna charge you higher. If you meet it, we charge you a bit lower, and so on and so forth. So there'll be some economic benefits to that as well, yeah? Next one, uh, this is an example from, uh, uh, for Sunway, the Sunway Reads, for example. So we, we basically uh, gave them, a, a work with them on the, on the uh, facility of about 250 million. And the two key clear KPIs that uh, we went for was increase in re re renewable energy generation and a reduction in build, uh, building energy intensity, yeah? And I think for most of you, you probably have a better sense than me, how doable is that? I think a lot of people are, a lot of the development and the construction industry is moving towards GBI, for example. That clearly qualifies for some of these things, right? And not only that, if you start thinking about this, we also have the opportunity to be able to help them transition. transition. Means upfitting an existing building to qualify for better renewable energy, or for example, more renewable energy and better uh, carbon emission plus waste treatment can also qualify as well, yeah? So the other one, uh, yeah, the uh, energy usage as well as re renewable energy generation. Uh, this one was another one with Axiata. Basically, uh, Axiata, we've uh, helped them with a uh, Islamic link uh, 
uh, what we call a uh, loan that is about 800 million um, US dollars. And this is tied to the reduction in their group total carbon footprint. So basically, they are able to put a, a benchmark or a dashboard, uh, you know, before this and after this. And their cheap, uh, the pricing of this is actually tied to their achievement of that targets regularly uh, on a yearly basis to be certified. Yeah. Okay. So that's all I have. I hope to be able to address more, uh, address more during the uh, session itself to questions. But by and large, I think just want to make sure that you know the banking industry, finance industry is together with you. We want to be part of this journey. We want to learn together with you as well. And I think, well, the intention is there to, to really help ESG. And this is quite essential for us to do good you know, by, do, uh, by doing well, by doing good moving forward as well. And it's something I must say is also for the whole banking industry as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope that's uh, useful. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Please yep. remain on stage. And I would like to invite all panel speakers in the afternoon session to join us on stage for the second moderated panel session with the moderator, David Hashim. To the audience, in the meantime, please scan the QR code using your phone to access Slido and post your question. Can you turn it on? So, wow. I mean, you know, sometimes conferences, the, the afternoon sessions uh, typically are not as exciting as the morning sessions. And I think some of our guests who are, who are missing now made a mistake because I think we had an awesome afternoon session. I learned a hell of a lot about this topic and I hope you did too. Give them a round of applause for our speakers. Um, now we have about um, 45 minutes or so to take some questions. And uh, I hope that you'll do your Slido questions. But while we're waiting for them to come in, uh, some already here. Wow, that was fast. Uh, I'm going to get started anyway. You know, as the moderator, I get the privilege of uh, asking some tough questions, first of all. Um, uh, so, Engineer Ahmad, th that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, Question I have, you know, a few years ago, uh, Dubai, Dubai made an announcement that all buildings uh, in Dubai of a certain size, beyond a certain size, I think it was 100,000 square feet, I'm not sure, uh, had to be uh, uh, certified. Do you think this, that we foresee something like that happening in Malaysia anytime in the future? Well, all certification here, green buildings per se is still voluntary, all right, unless the local government asks for a certain certification for certain buildings that is built in a certain zone. Okay. However, you all heard about the EECA Act, right? Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. It's stuck, oh, I shouldn't be saying this. It's stuck at Parliament. Uh, they haven't actually given the green light yet. Mm -hmm. But once they give the green light, all buildings, all buildings must declare hmm. its energy use so that's coming perhaps that's coming as soon as whatever that we are going through now it's over i think it's coming okay i'm confident and and, and following up on that there's a question here the second question today you've talked about way to cal cal carbon score for buildings yeah. do we foresee a time where there will be a carbon score for townships township carbon yeah i mean a township is just a collection of buildings right well, if I can define it that way. So if every building has its own carbon score and the services that connects every building also can be carbon scored. So mm. why not? It's, it's a built environment and we, we could have mm. right, a carbon score for townships. But that would include things like the transportation, the waste 
treatments, uh, the uh, um, independent power plant, or or uh, yeah. all the infrastructure that takes uh, up the. Uh, I, would, I would go so far as saying that it is coming. Mm. It is coming. Once we have settled down with the buildings, we are going to look at conflicts. Great. Well, that's uh, uh, good to know. Um, got a question here uh, for Mr. Chung. Okay. What are banks doing to encourage rooftop solar installation on existing buildings? Or are the banks doing anything to encourage rooftop solar installations on existing buildings, especially uh, residential, uh, commercial? Yeah. Is there any type of financing that's allowed for that? Is the mic on? Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, we have fun. Okay, so there are, there are two levels, right? Number one, as the developers, the second, as a homeowner. We do have a solar panel financing uh, for the homeowners as well. We are encouraging that. Uh, the take up, I must say, is a little bit slow, but I do envision that to quickly pick up as and when the EV adoption comes in. Because you're familiar with the EV adoption, right? Most of the time, they will be charging at home. So it really makes sense to have the solar plus the EV charge as well. So there's something that we're pushing uh, in terms of that. And for the, the, the corporate side, uh, you know, the, the construction industry and so on and so forth. Basically, if you come to us with a, with a project to say you want to fit out uh, uh, what you call uh, solar panels as part of that, you will qualify either as a sustainability link if it's not big enough, you could be part and parcel of a larger uh, corporate facility or can qualify direct for the green financing as well. Good. So anybody, any of you want to put solar panels on your roof, speak to Mr. Chung after this. Um, <laughs> I'll help you install it. Yeah, but I think uh, he's more interested in the big uh, corporate solar, uh, both, solar both, projects. Both. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course. Uh, question for Raymond. By the way, your, your, your presentation put the fear of God in many, many of us. Up, yeah. I'm, for one, going to be speaking to my compliance people tomorrow <laughs> about some new uh, uh, conditions that we have to place upon people. Uh, one of the things that we did when we joined Transparency International many years ago when we joined, um, we used it as an, as an opportunity to train our staff and to make them all sign uh, individual oaths uh, of, com of compliance to uh, anti-bribery, anti-corruption. And I would encourage you all to do the same. Join TI and do the same thing. Um, I was just curious about the way the CPI is, is, is captured. I mean, uh, is it... Is it possible to select who does the scoring? I mean, who does the scoring? Uh, is it random? And is, are there ways to manipulate that? Can we really trust these scores? Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, first thing I would like to start, I was not trying to instill fear earlier. <laughs> that was not a main objective for the presentation, but the whole idea was basically to encourage organizations to make sure that they put in place proper procedures because uh, the 17 capital A that I spoke about just now, it's not too much of uh, to penalize companies. It's not towards punishing. It's towards promoting preventive measures. That's the whole idea. So that was what I was trying to <laughs> basically uh, deliver earlier. Now, coming back to the question just now, uh, when you mentioned about the CPI, I, I totally get uh, the apprehension. I totally grab, get the defensiveness and the continuous questions on the reliability and validity of the study, per se, the results, right? So what happens is uh, the CPI scoring is done country to country. We have a number of about 15 surveys that are done for each country. You need to have about a minimum number of surveys done in each country in order for you to qualify on that list of 180 countries, right? So the primary uh, part participants or the respondents are usually from the business side, I mean the Chamber of Commerce or the associations and also academic side. These are people dealing with the public sector, right? And we have to understand that it's not another country evaluating us. It's not uh, Berlin, the, the, our secretary in Germany, evaluating Malaysia and giving them a score. It's Malaysians evaluating Malaysia. So every country on the CPI is their own people telling the uh, telling those uh, that are collecting the data how they feel about their own country. So we cannot say that it's a, an agenda by, by the West or by anything like that. It, but it needs to cover a number of segments, which I didn't have time to go through, but we have a number of surveys. We take the composite index of that survey, and that's how you are scored every year. Hence, and the validity and the reliability of it, it's internationally recognized. We have audits done and make sure that this is all in par with the international standards. Hmm. Right. Okay, that sounds pretty fair. Um, I was so impressed with Nje Razif's presentation. I mean, that was really quite something. Um, I've read about the work that uh, Simon Darby Properties is doing, but to see it so clearly, uh, this uh, Almina Rainforest Knowledge Center, uh, quite an investment 
that you've made. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, and this force for good, I think that's a really important point to make. I mean, this is the whole thing behind ESG. Um, would, it be, would it be fair to say that because uh, Syme Darby Properties is a GLC, that you have um, a, an unfair advantage against uh, over other PLCs or SMEs, uh, and how would you address that? And how would you urge your smaller competitors, say, to use you, what you've done as an inspiration? Um, I see our advantage is the scale that we have. Yes, um, historically, uh, we had that Saimda be across uh, a few companies and our ability to purchase land from Saimda plantation, they sell us at commercial value, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Point taken. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but we have scale. Um, for the, to the question on um, how do we encourage the smaller developer to be, uh, to be on board, um, I, I reckon it has to start from the top. The, if, if you recall my presentation, it's about that sincerity. Uh, it is, it, there's a sincere intent for us to make sure that the planet benefit from our presence. The ecological corridor, for example, the boss is talking about uh, soil health. Uh, when you plant very densely, uh, the, the, the soil becomes a lot healthier and therefore it can sequester a lot, uh, a lot more. Uh, in a development that's already selling all our homes anyway very, um, uh, very successfully. Uh, so uh, my thinking is the, an organization that takes triple bottom line seriously, it is not only about, about profit, but it's also people and planet, and take it to uh, the DNA of, of the organization, that's what will change, uh, change things around. But it has to start uh, from the top. Um, if, a leadership, uh, if a leadership is not committed to it, and it's only paying lip service, everything breaks down very quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for Engineer Ahmad. Um, I'm not sure, sure if this is a fair question because it's quite, quite um, uh, vague or open. Um, for an existing building to obtain a net zero carbon emission score, uh, and what, what kind of cost would be, cost can uh, owners of existing buildings uh, envision? Are there any parameters or guides? Uh, it depends on how much energy do you want to save. It depends on where do you want to be in the carbon scale itself, right? Uh, through experience, I've done a few, right? Uh, existing building energy efficiency. It can range between nothing to <laughs> millions of dollars, right? It depends on how big your building is, obviously. And normally, if an existing building gets the timing right, means that Equipment can only last so long, 20 years, 25 years. But once they want to change the equipment and they say that, ah, now is the best time for me to actually, you know, get my energy efficiency thing going, right? That's the best time. They only have to pay it once. That means that you do not have to cost changing equipment and energy efficiency, right, initiatives. So you have both at once. So I've done one bidding, I won't mention which one, okay? In the end, they say, um, you know, I'm giving you 75,000 to do green costs. I did not even touch that 75,000. And I get that building to be, you know, better than before in terms of energy use. Mm. So, because they time it together with changing the chillers. So, you know, if you change to a new car, whether you like it or not, that car would be more efficient than your old car. Isn't it? In terms of using fuel without doing anything. Right? So, same rule applies to buildings. And I believe there's some incentives, tax incentives and yes. uh, uh, import duty incentives or deductions for uh, the equipment that you uh, purchase to upgrade the buildings. Maybe you could describe a little bit okay, about that. Uh, last time, I think a few years back, there was this safe program from the government where if you change chillers, they will actually uh, pay for you to change the chillers, put it simply in that way. But the thing is, on the commercial end, on people like us, we would know. Okay, they even extend those that program to cover even refrigerators and TVs, but hmm. nobody knows. Hmm. So we could have gotten money back from that a few years back, and now they don't offer it anymore. 
Okay, <laughs> tough luck, right? Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, on that uh, question on township just now, right? Uh, actually, I, I have to mention this that uh, Kementerian Perumahan dan Kerajaan Tempatan has always have this uh, LCCF, a uh, low uh, carbon city framework available since 2012. It's been there a long time. Okay, but of course, there's no label stuck on the entrance to the township that says that this is the carbon score. Okay, but they have this framework and it is being adopted by most local governments okay, in their townships. Yeah, I think a lot of what we, a lot of what we're hearing today is been public knowledge is that people just don't know that these things are out there, right? Yeah. It's the same as what we're hearing from Mr. Chung, that there's so much financing out there available if it's green. Yeah. You know, if you can argue for its um, sustainability aspect, yeah. there's trillions of dollars waiting to be loaned. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Mr. Chung, you could explain a little bit more about that, um, how banks are seeking green projects for financing. There sh is there really a shortage of really green projects out there to finance. You, you kind of notice, at least from the, uh, from the uh, group OCBC, right? We set a target of 25 by 25 previously last year. We want 25 billion US dollars uh, group wide to be, uh, to be achieved by year 2025. We actually exceeded that. So right now we're moving to 50 billion. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think from a, uh, at least I can speak for OCBC, but I do know for a fact the other banks locally as well, there's an appetite for this one because now, Again, I bring in regulators because it's real, it's becoming a board governance issue. Central bankers are also asking you know, for, for bank boards to have sustainability councils as well, or committees in a sense. So everyone's looking at it, everyone's like trying to figure out the answer a little bit more than having solutions, right? So hence, I always believe it's something to work with industry through a different type of industry, uh, help us to understand how we can also assist and work together to, to do that as well. So the opportunities are clearly there. Uh, even from uh, OCBC Malaysia, we mentioned about 15% of the loan books, right? That's easily doubling what we have right now. I, I won't go through the specific numbers. So I'm just saying that if you have a compelling proposition, a compelling uh, story, there's a sustainability, sustainability or sustainability linked, right? I think we are very open for conversation. Of course, we also need to understand a bit more because of governance, making sure it really meet tick boxes, it's not greenwashing, etc. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's always a challenge. Mm. Uh, we mentioned greenwashing in the morning. Yep. Um, and hopefully agencies and um, consultants can, can better you know, do their job to prevent that from happening because it's their reputation also, Agreed. which will be affected. Yep. Here's a new question, and I think maybe uh, Jay Razif, please. Um, a lot of sustainable townships are not located near job centers or other commercial developments. They're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, what are developers like Sarm Darby doing to bridge the commute or the mobility gap? Um, you know, like for example, your Elmina is an absolutely gorgeous township, but there's a lot of com commuting uh, from Elmina to Subang Jaya or PJ or Sha'alam or Klang, KL. Um, uh, so since you're such a big player, what can you be doing more to reduce the carbon that's going to be caused by all that commuting and transportation? Um, for people to commute, uh, we are very conscious that for people who have to commute to work, our location is not ideal, right? Um, what we, um, and, and therefore providing trains and whatnot is beyond our, uh, our control or our sphere of influence. Uh, what we do, however, making sure that if you, once you are within the township, um, there are every bit of opportunity for you to minimize your carbon footprint. Uh, Elmina alone has 90 kilometers. Or I'm not promoting Elmina, I'm just saying it. <laughs> uh, has yes, you are promoting it, and that's fine. Go on. <laughs> has 90 kilometers of uh, bicycle and footpaths, encouraging people, uh, people to, you know, uh, to walk around. Uh, uh, to, sorry, to, to uh, move around. And then there is the question on people with lower affordability. Um, so the further you stay, the more expensive your toll and, and uh, mobility charges. Uh, so our philosophy is um, for affordable homes, make sure that they are as close as possible to uh, transit or uh, there's, there's transit oriented development uh, where they can uh, get to train or buses fairly easily and they are not in the middle of uh, nowhere. They are located at a, a fairly strategic uh, location. 
I got a question for uh, another question for Raymond. You know, Malaysian culture. Okay, I think you know where I'm going here, right? <laughs> Malaysian culture. There's always, um, how would I put it, um, a very gray area, where if you don't um, um, host, say, for example, a local a local uh, authority officer, you know. Uh, member of MPPJ or MPAJ or DBKL, if you don't, you know, uh, attend their children's wedding and give them a duit hadiah or, you know, uh, buy them coffee and tea or, or these kind of small gestures, right? And these are gray gestures which can slowly get bigger and bigger if you're not careful. But it's a very Asian thing to show gratitude. Um, how, does, how does your... Um, uh, what was it uh, provision 17a is it <laughs> yeah. so how does provision 17a address that very inherent custom it's actually not uh, uh, it's an asian custom it's a malaysian custom to show gratitude yep um i totally agree with that definitely uh it's a uh, asian culture where we show gratitude we give gifts we you know blanja do it i wouldn't say do it kopi lah. Uh, we take them out for lunch or things like that now, here is where we draw the line. We draw the line when there is a corrupt intent. Okay, that's tougher than what I'm saying. Okay? So in that sense, you see, when we brought up the case of adequate procedures under 17 capital A as a defense, right? One of the parts we mentioned is you need to have a gift policy within the organization. We never said have a no gift policy. Okay, you don't need to have a no gift policy. That's, that cannot be done. As you rightly pointed out, there's no way you can do that but have a gift policy and make sure that disclosure and transparency is there when gifts are given out and it needs to and it, it needs to commensurate to what you're doing so you just say you're going for someone's uh, kids wedding or something like that you give certain amount of money because you're attending a dinner that's different right but if you're taking the whole uh, family out to to bali for a holiday that something is wrong Right? It does not make sense. And of course, if you have ongoing business relationship with someone and they are due for renewal, for example, their contract is due for renewal, and you give them an expensive gift or you receive an expensive gift, there is a corrupt intent. So we've got to make sure that the idea of corrupt intent is not there when gifts are given out and we, it needs to be transparent. That's the whole idea. Yep. Yeah, I hope that gives some guidance. Not 100% not clear, but still uh, we're going to figure that out. Um, going back to Engineer Ahmad, um, I think one of the questions is carbon scoring for strata titled development. Like, how do you do a carbon score for a service department, a uh, thousand units, uh, high rise service apartment, which has all been sold and uh, occupied and owned by residents? Can you really do a carbon score for that? Well, this is an age-old question, I guess. When you get certification for the building, for any green certification, nowadays also it is for the whole building. It's not for one unit. So you can actually look at it that way also. You're looking at it for the whole building. To what is a norm? What is the norm score, right? And then how has it been improved in terms of design so, and usage, of course. So it can be done? It can be done. It is a bit difficult. It can, it can open, you know, we can open ourselves for arguments, right? But it can be done. Because then you're working with each of the families, the residents of a thousand units, yeah. trying to encourage them to reduce their electricity consumption. It's the same as any green certification. When you buy that property, right, that strata property, right, you know what you're getting into because they say that this is a green building, uh, this is my certificate. Unless you do not want to keep the certificate or unless you do not want to keep the certain uh, carbon score, then hmm. if you want to keep this, then there's certain rules that you need to follow. You know, you need to act in a certain way. Hmm. Right? So you need to get the right people to buy your property. Uh, I might be getting flagged for saying that. <laughs> uh, David, can I add? Please, go ahead. Um, I, um, the carbon score is actually very interesting. Uh, so... Um, for, for a company like us, we have, I call them carbon geek, right? So, so they can calculate all the carbon numbers, accurately know how much carbon is emitted from a particular product. What I like about the carbon score, it gives the power to the people, right? All this data that these carbon geeks of my team has is now uh, is put into an app, I assume, and, and people can actually calculate. So it's actually a very awesome tool, I reckon. 
you get everyone to be involved. Yes, right? correct. The people who stay in the building, they, don't, they know what the number means because they are actually contributing to that number. Yeah. Right? Um, this reminds me of a, a building that I visited in, uh, in Portland, Oregon uh, recently. And it was, it was the first building to be categorized in the United States as the Living Building Challenge. The Living Building Challenge, it's a simple six-story building in downtown Portland, and it's a building that's disconnected from the grid, from the power grid, from the water supply grid, and even the waste treatment grid. Everything in that building, it's a modern five-story office building, but it's completely disconnected. They recycle all their water, and they put it back into the toilet system. Uh, it's quite amazing. If you all want to look into it, it's called the Living Building Challenge. It's a building in uh, Portland, Oregon. I think that's the new, going to be the new benchmark after, you know, platinum uh, uh, numbers are exceeded. Um, one of the other questions um, about uh, the scoring system that's come up is vertical, vertical landscaping. Uh, we notice that your, your scoring system doesn't uh, give any points or any scoring for what the buildings look like you know, how green they look. It's about how green they function. So is there no factor to capture the, um, the preference, visual preference, or, you know, landscape gardens, roof gardens? Does that make any difference into the scoring system? Uh, okay, let me clarify that again. Those numbers that you see, the big numbers on the left side of the lever deals with energy, mm. right? You also have another smaller number down below that deals with the carbon okay. footprint. Okay, you might say that my building, you know, my facade is made out of creeper plants. Okay, let's say for example, right? Now, how does that, uh, how, how does that translate to energy? Yes, it does, right? Because why? Now you have less heat coming in, so if you're air conditioning in the space, you're using less air conditioning and you're using less energy. It does not translate directly but it does contribute to that particular number of carbon score because it reduces down your energy use to cool down the building. You're going to use, you have a smaller carbon footprint on your energy that you use. That's how it's related. Uh, if you want to go and say, what credits do I get from actually having a vertical landscape, you can always go to another tool. You can always go to GBI. You can always go to Green RE, you know, that has points given for that particular uh, initiative. Okay, so it, in a way it can be scored indirectly be scored. though, right? It is in there, mm. but it does not appear like, okay, I, I have two points coming from a vertical landscape. Mm. That's, that's in, in, in DBKL, it used to be that if your building has certain green features, mm -hmm. um, like vertical landscaping, sky gardens and so on, you might get a higher plot ratio. But even that, I think, has uh, been um, suspended because now because of the KLCP uh, 2040 uh, master plan. So now you get your plot ratio. Unfortunately, unlike Singapore, in Singapore, you get higher plot ratio for doing these added green features. Um, you get more plot ratio. And I wish that uh, condition um, was back here. I want to go back to Encik Razif on what something you said about leadership. Um, so it's... It, it, it seems like much of S, uh, Saim Darby Properties um, culture today is uh, uh, driven from top down, like a leadership a vision. Um, but how much of this transformation is also bottom up? And how do you describe that relationship between top down, that means the leader, uh, Dr. Azmir in your case, saying this is what we should do, versus bottom up, meaning the staff saying, boss, why don't we do this, 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 this? How does this mechanism, how does this um, dynamic work in Syme Derby? Um, bottoms up is not done yet, and that, uh, let, uh, let me share our plan. Uh, so the first year is uh, top down. Um, make a lot of noise around sustainability. The second year, uh, which is 2022, is establish a system that gets down to half the organization. Uh, for example, it's a simple KPI around, say, safety, right, which is under social. 
Um, but it will only impact uh, four levels from Dato' Azmi, right? And it's a deliberate one. We do not want to do too much and you dilute the effect. In 2023, our plan is to get the young ones. Mm. We, call, uh, at the, we don't have a name yet, but we're thinking of something along the line of young sustainability uh, change agent, where, the, where we want to take that system and go deeper. And these uh, young sustainability change agents will, will create the excitement at their, at their unit. Um, I take your point. I don't think I have wrapped my head around it. So I take your point that I, the young sustainability change agent should also be a platform where the voice can come uh, upwards. At the moment, it was not part of the thought, but stealing. Your I, th idea, I think it's I something think that all important. organizations yeah. need to to yes, you know figure out. Like even in our own organization, you know, I do not want to dictate too much Correct. because the ideas should come from the bottom Correct. because if they come from the bottom and the younger generation have a lot more ideas than Correct. this old guy, you know, um, a lot of the activities of our Veritas Fund for Excellence, the VFE, they're, they're not suggested by me. They're suggested by our young staff. And I Correct. say, great, here's a check. You go and do it. So I, I think that um, is a way to mobilize young people and get them active in these ESG questions. Yeah. Let them be motivated by these things. Exactly. They're especially motivated by the E, right? But also the S, uh, you know, uh, social community outreach, which I think Sime Darby does a lot. Yes. You know, uh, working with uh, underprivileged in your communities. And that can be done by your staff, the younger right. staff especially. Right. Yep. Hmm. Would anyone like to address that, uh, Mr. Chung? I'm sure your bank does a lot of this as well. Similar as well. So, so uh, I mean, of course, banks, again, number-driven. There's the top-down KPI, so-called, right? We will encourage people on that one. So basically, we empower the team, and uh, within each team, there will be sustainability champions, they, they call it, right? And they are given a certain budget to go do what they need to do, right? So we, we, we don't prescribe the, the idea, but basically, they understand what ESG and what fits into this one. And basically, we'll let them loose and so on. And then you find the whole organization as part of a culture building program, right? Hopefully for long, long term, uh, goes into a lot of minor man activities. You know, last week, you know, in the, in the food court on Lemnaro OCBC, eighth floor, you know, we had the showcase of all the EV uh, cars over there. And then this week, we have people going to do mangrove. I'm supposed to go to mangrove next week. And there's another uh, round of uh, uh, CSR, uh, you know, to help the refugees and so on. So you find the, 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 the organization, if you let them loose, you know, with the principles, the, the, I, I feel people in general gets pretty engaged because people do want to go, do good. Uh, at least that's my view, right? How I've gotten to know OCBC in yep. KL and Dato Ong is, yes. is through cycling. Yes, um, yes. One of one of the things that they do is support KL Car Free, mm -hmm. and if you go down to DBKL on any Sunday morning, yep. uh, it's your young staff. I, mm -hmm. I don't see mm, too many of the older guys, <laughs> but I see mostly the younger people, yep. and they're all there, you know, with the bikes yep. and giving the bikes. Is it for free? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're just you know just come down and take an OCBC bike and go for a ride. Hopefully you get the bike back. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise they just cycle off. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully they carry their brand around. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Yet. Well, I think, I think we're coming to the, to the end and I think that's fine. Um, not getting too many more questions. I think we've answered every single question that we have out there. Um, but I think that uh, this panel have done a fantastic job um, and have entertained all of us and taught us a lot. Uh, I, I think we, they deserve another round of applause, everyone. Give them another round. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank, you. thank you, guys. We would like to thank the speakers and the audience for gracing the event and the sponsors for supporting us. Without each and every one of you, this lecture series will be in vain and knowledge sharing will be fruitless. I would like to also specifically thank the hotel management, the event organizer, Fusion Works. And of course, the organizing team and the top management of Veritas Design Group and 27 Advisory. We believe this lecture series is educational yet entertaining and at the very least inspiring that when we go home this evening, we ask not what, we, not what the built environment can do for us, but what we can do for the built environment. In the aspect of environmental, social and governance, with that, that's a wrap for VLS 2022. Thank you very much.